hi guys welcome back to the channel i won't even waste your time today guys please subscribe to the channel like the video share you already know the drill we need to get into this it's getting serious guys the theory is happening we are alive i will spare you the darwinism and evolution theory talk and we get straight into it in this new chapter blue lock added some twists to two concepts that we understand quite differently in general geniuses and prodigies a prodigy is defined as a young individual who exhibits extraordinary skill or talent in a particular field at a notably early age. This exceptional ability signifies significant potential for future success and accomplishments. What distinguishes a prodigy is not only the advanced capabilities but also the ability to achieve results comparable to those who have dedicated significantly more time to the discipline even if they commence the exploration later than their peers. A genius, however, typically refers to someone with exceptional intellectual or creative abilities, often exceeding the average person's capacity to innovate, solve complex problems, or produce original work. The definitions of both terms slightly change when it comes to football in real life. Nowadays, the consensus in football is that a prodigy is typically a young player or a player with little experience showing exceptional skill and talent that far exceeds what's expected at their age or given their amount of experience. Usually, prodigies make their professional debut early in their teens, showing an ability to perform at the highest level under pressure of the top leagues. Lamin Yamal is a prodigy. Lionel Messi is a prodigy. Wayne Rooney is a prodigy, right? Not that prodigies have not shown anything unseen before. We're not talking about anything brand new. It's just that they do it too early. A football genius is a player who consistently demonstrates exceptional insight, creativity, and mastery of the game, often pushing the boundaries of what is strategically and technically possible. Football geniuses may take years to reach their peak, unlike prodigies, but their impact on the field is transformative. Lionel Messi is an obvious example, and I think we can all agree on He's a genius. Blue Lock added a twist to this because, as you see, time is an essential factor when deciding who is a prodigy and who is a genius. So Blue Lock added the following twist. Geniuses are innovators in a sense. They showcase something unseen before, or they raise the bar to an unthinkable level. Prodigies in Blue Lock demonstrate remarkable learning abilities, allowing them to adapt and consider geniuses to either enhance or diminish their impact. This is a critical twist. However, we also need to note that Jempachi Ego states that evolution is driven by people who are born with something different. Either far taller than the norm, more robust, way more intelligent, or super sensitive. Hmm, just like Izagi maybe. Ego states that geniuses are born with something different, allowing them to innovate and change the world's standards. A proper real-life example would be Usain Bolt. His sole existence changed the world of track and field. The caveat though is, Ego's theory is that geniuses cannot make the shift in the world on their own. There is a need for another type of talent that can, in blue lock terms, devour what the genius is about and make it accessible to the ordinary people so that the baseline expectations can be raised. Again, Wushan Bolt's arrival revolutionized training methods enabling times once deemed impossible 20 years ago. We observed how a genius like Shidu is a unique talent who operates beyond conventional limits. Itoshi Sae succeeded in taking that genius and establishing a formula for effectively using an anomaly like Shidu, which aligns with Ego's ideas of prodigy and geniuses. Please keep in mind that all of this is Jempachi Ego's theory, and as such, this can be flawed. So it's not something to hold as an absolute truth. Which brings us to my next point. One reality of life is highlighted again in Blue Lock. There's always more than meets the eye. For instance, after Izaki's awakening during the Manchine City game, everyone suddenly took notice of his positioning. While his positioning is visible, the intangible qualities often go unnoticed. His football IQ, speed of execution, rational thinking, composure, among others. 
We all agree that Rin is a genius, but he's not the fastest player, not the best dribbler in the world, he's not the strongest. His shooting ability definitely doesn't surpass the ones of Noel Noah, and he's not better than Lorenzo on defense. So why is Rin considered a genius? It's because he was born with an elite body and crazy intangibles. Noel Noah is ambidextrous, right? Do you think that's the only thing that makes him a genius? Of course not. Noah is a package of ex exceptional physique, high football IQ, the rare gift of ambidextry, and a lot of intangibles. Nagi is a genius when it comes to trapping, but trapping alone isn't why Nagi is a genius. I think you get my point. There are visible talents and the intangibles, the invisible ones. Kaiser has a weapon in the Kaiser Impact, so powerful that it's not stupid to think that he's a genius. To be honest, Kaiser was born with an incredible body that makes his swing the fastest in the world. But that alone isn't enough, you need more to turn that into something as powerful as the Kaiser Impact. Genpachi Ego understands that physical ability alone are not enough to define a player greatness. He demonstrated that by introducing a player whose physical stats are comparable to Noah's. Yet Kunigami doesn't play anything like Noel Noah at all. If physical attributes were the sole factor, Kunigami would be ranked among the top 10 players in the world maybe, or maybe the top 20. But he isn't even the best in blue lock. Intangibles, my friend. Intangibles contribute significantly to a player's originality, which is why geniuses like Rin, Loki, Noah, Shidu, Nagi, Pachira, all those geniuses stand out because they possess qualities that go beyond mere statistics, mere the physique. To truly thrive as a genius, one must embrace one's originality. Failing to do so means not fooling, using all the potential a player is born with. Izagi believed that Kaizo was a genius, and as such, he should have been born with an inherent advantage. Therefore, he shouldn't complain when confronted with the unfair advantages of other geniuses, right? However, Kaizo's reaction and anger caused Izagi to reconsider this perspective, leading me to believe my theory will unfold actually. If Kaiser truly isn't a genius, how does he fit the definition of a prodigy that Ego described? Kaiser clearly has created something unprecedented, boasting the fastest swing in the world and extraordinary shooting precision. This combination is not something one can simply train to achieve. While you can train to improve your accuracy, there will always be a limit to how fast you can swing your leg unless you possess the exceptional trait that Kaiser was born with. Kaiser to me is an anomaly and as such could rightfully be described as a genius. However, if Kaiser is nothing but a prodigy, a talented learner like Jempachi Ego described, who was simply born with the body, with the potential of having the fastest swing in the world, how did Kaiser manage to look like a genius in Izagi's eyes? So maybe Izagi's definition of a genius is not the same one as the one from Ego. To me, the answer is kind of simple. Kaiser embraced his originality fully and he trained accordingly. He said it himself in his backstory. To survive in the environment that he was in, he needed an overwhelming weapon to prove his existence. He needed to make an impact. Kaiser embraced his malice and we all know how he used Ness. So if Kaiser is a prodigy who maximized his gift to craft a weapon able to rival geniuses born with unfair advantages, what should Izagi do? This is where Izagi should be prompted to rethink the way he has been playing. Izagi has been playing without looking within himself. Izagi never stopped once to question how it is that he could have premonitions and vision of future events. How is it that he could instantly come up with the two guns volley when cornered? I know he said he copied plays and adapted, but how does that work? Like deeply, profoundly, how does that work Izagi? What are the mechanisms of his psyche that manifests in such ways? The answer is simple. This has all to do with Izagi's originality. He even said it himself, he never played with originality. 
And what did Ego say before this game? It's all about player's originality. Going down that road, Izagi will realize that he must have been born with something that he hasn't fully understood yet. His incredible senses and his core desire to play football to crush strong opponents and rejoice at the feeling of being the one controlling the script. I am sure that Izagi hasn't realized yet that the way he sees the world or the way he experiences the world is quite unique to him. I remember when Izagi first unlocked MetaVision, the art was quite a little bit, it struck me because the design, it was as if everything around Izagi was in slow motion. It's as if Izagi wears a special lens as he experiences the world. Maybe he still thinks that that is the same for everyone. The same way he had to talk to Yukimiya and Corona in the Ubers game to realize that they cannot see the world the way he does, since they lack meta vision. I think Izagi seriously take for granted the way he senses and experiences the world. I think he really takes for granted the way he sees and the way he minds his mind works. And he has yet to even try to maximize their use. Maybe, and that's just a theory, maybe Izagi will be able to better use the plays he's been seeing and watching since he unlocked meta vision because meta vision forces him to use his senses at a higher level than usual. Therefore, seeing more than what ordinary people see. Maybe that's why Izagi always have more details. He always sees more. He always perceives more. He feels more. Side note though, I don't think Izagi truly cares about being number one. That's just maybe his lack of confidence talking because he feels like he needs the accolade of number one. However, Izagi truly wants to defeat Rin because Rin is the next target on his hit list. Izagi is all about beating the strongest. Yeah. Kaiser beat him, done that. In Manchester City game, he humiliated Kaiser, playmaking wise. In the Ubers game, he scored more than Kaiser. Done. Now, next target is Rin. So Izagi truly wants to beat Rin. He likes to beat strong opponents. The only issue with Noah is because Noah is his hero and he admires Noah. Okay? So. Defeating Rin can mean many things, and it doesn't necessarily mean scoring a goal. Anyway, no matter how Izagi finally win against Rin, it cannot be, in my eyes, be, it cannot be without Izagi realizing that he needs to embrace his originality, his intangibles he was born with. I will make another post diving deeper into those, but also, have you noticed how Izagi has yet to notice that a genius like Rin was stopped by an ordinary player like Igaguri. Like, Izagi hasn't even registered it yet because he's so self-centered. He's all up in the cloud, all up in his head, thinking about what he can do, how powerless he is. He fails to realize what's happening around him. Anyway, I can't wait to see if my theory comes true. Please drop your thoughts down in the comment below and I'm going to see you in the next time. Peace.